Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, I want to thank the Sutter family for their praise and worship rendition. We know they take time to put it together, and we appreciate it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I guess we can unmute ourselves now. Okay. So, again, we continue with our question and answer deliberations. And if you have questions, you can put it forth. As you know, we participate. So we have two questions we want to deal with. If you have questions, you can put it forth. All right. This week's Torah portion is, is talking about the zit zit. So, so the question was asked or is being asked. Three-part question and we're going to go into it, see what time we have to, to deal with it. And it's what does it mean by the border? Put the zit zit on the border. What is that? And should ladies wear zit zit? First two parts of the question. Okay. So let's look at the. You know what? Then I got there. You know. Let's look at the. Um, let me share the screen here. The scripture where that is taken from, as the, as the Torah portion this week is Numbers 13 to 15. So we're looking at 15. And, and it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, so here is, is the Lord speaking to Moses, right? Not Moses making it up. And he said, speak to the children of Israel. Again, the children of Israel include both male and female. And bid them that they make fringes in the borders. The first question is about borders of their garments throughout their generation. And they put up on the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. All right. So let's look at the word borders and see what it means so everybody can see. All right. We're going to do some Hebrew interlinear here now. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make Fringes. Let's do borders first. Okay, borders is eight six, three six seven one. All right, and the Hebrew word is kanaf, right? Kanaf. That's the Hebrew. Is three six seven zero. All right. What's the what's the meaning? Also, we have different meaning. It it's it's used winged, wing seven four seventy four times. Skirt 14 times, borders two times, and corners two times. So I think the two main um, <clears throat> dispute we have, is it on the borders or the corners? Personally, it doesn't really matter as long as you're trying to obey. All right? So I'm going to show you two different, there are groups that does does it on the borders all around, and some do it on the corners. We wear the ones that you, that you see us wearing, like this one is on the corner, as the corner of blue. All right? So let me see if I can. Okay, so we have all different fringes here. And this is the one that you see me wear sometimes at the congregation. I like it. It's, it's kind of unique. Come on, yes, okay. You see, this is the, the one you see us wearing sometimes. It's kind of unique, a little bit different from the regular. Uh, sometimes isn't it called like a shoulder. isn't that called like a tallit the or something? Yes, like that? yes, yes, yes. And you can wear it like that too. And then these are the ones I would say, this is these are the ones that interpret it to be the corners. Those who interpret it to be the border um, would be a picture like this. Let me see if I can get this picture bigger. Uh, 
All right, so here we see a lady wearing a skirt and she has a ball. Let me bring it up bigger. Right, you see, she has fringes on the borders of the skirt and she has a blue thread around it. Different, different style. There she is again, fringes and the blue. I have, um, there are men who wear that too. In, in some circles. Let me see if I can find. Okay, here is a, um, let me see. I'm gonna touch the arm. Um, see if I can get a picture here up. up. Okay, here is a gentleman with his children and he's wearing some borders around and the blue also. So nothing is wrong with either um, position. But some people will argue that it should be this way, it should be that way. But as long as you have the blue thread and the corner or border, and some, some do, um, some Israelites do have some fringes on the garment. Let me see, like this one here is this one. All right, let's do this one. All right, if you look at this one, you can see little, you see some of those white things there. They have that, those are fringes also and going around and then they have the zit zit with the blue thread in the corner of the garment. So that's because, that's because the interpretation of the, the word can be corner or um, borders. A anybody have any solution to that? Anything? Fringes, really that kind of. That's because the word can also be borders or corners, ends, wings, but it's used wings 74 times, borders and corners twice. I had a, a statement about it. Yes. Um, years ago, I had somebody come up to me in, in the congregation, it was actually during Yom Kippur, and they're like, uh, you know, I had my CTs from the belt loops, and that person said, "Oh, you want to go to somebody, and they, they wear it a certain way or something, you know?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, you're not supposed to bathe or wear perfume, supposedly on Yom Kippur, but you know, so right. it's really not. It's not necessarily like how you wear it or where you wear it. It's really the meaning behind it, you know. So I think right. people really." forget that and lose that that's the key right that's the meaning is the meaning behind it all right so the next question would be now we know in some circles um they do not want ladies to wear it but the bible did not say that i remember um i was at a congregation and a lady walked into the congregation with her zit zit on during praise and worship and the leader wanted to escort her out and i stopped him i said no you can't do that it's praise and worship. So he was upset with me after that. <laughs> I said, it's not appropriate for you to do. Talk to her after the service, you know, and say, this is your position. But if she challenged you to say, show me the scripture, then you're going to have problems. You know, that everything we do is based on the scriptures. The, um, see, the scripture says, Speak, let me go back up here. Where is it there? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. We know the word for children is bene, and the word for sons is ben. And sometimes they'll say, Oh, he's talking about he's talking to the male. No, he says children. That means everybody, male and female, can can wear it in different forms how they want to wear it. It doesn't really matter. We don't have any scripture to support. Not doing it. Okay, so that's the first part. That's the, 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 the question there. And we don't have a problem with that. As we're trying to follow the scriptures and not man-made traditions. All right, so with that said now, um, there is, I think we mentioned it last week. I think Linda brought it up, the, the 613 commandments. So what we're going to do for the next question is asking us, can we, the 613 commandments, what are they? 
All right, so you can go on the internet and you can find the 613. So what we're gonna do for the next couple of weeks is we're gonna be looking at some of the commandments that are in the 613 and see if they are still relevant today. All right, so we're gonna look at some of the, you can go on the internet and you can find list of these commandments. Let me just do that quickly and see, and then we're gonna run through six, 613. I think I made that. There are comes in different order, but it's the same. Let me see the one I want. Let's do this one. Uh, there are two of them. All right, so here are some of the lists, a full list of the mitzvah, all the way down to um, 613. But some of them you can see it goes all the way to 613. Some of them you can put them in categories. I think I think this side put them in categories. They kind of break them up in brackets. Uh, let me see. I think this one here. Yes, this one put them in brackets. They have ones for God and Torah and signs and symbols, prayer and blessing, love and brotherhood, poor, unfortunate, treatment of Gentiles, marriage, divorce. You know, they break it up. All right, so you can find them on the, on the internet there. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at some of these and see if they are still relevant today and if they are not, why? Why not? So I'm gonna, um, stop sharing here and then we're gonna go something. Wait, let me do the whiteboard. All right. So I'm gonna do something here. Let me see if I can do something here now. Okay, let's do. And then use the color. I think red is good. So let me draw something here. I'm gonna draw something. Let me erase that. See if I can draw it big enough. All right, let's do this one like that. All right, this is like this is like the food chain, right? So we're gonna. All right, so this is the commandment chain, right? Like the food chain. So this is gonna be the greatest of all commandment is love. Let me put it in all caps so you get bigger. Yes. Is love. And then we have this one, the 10 commandments. And then we have 613. All right. So we know love is the number one. If, you, if we have love, if we don't have love and we keep in the Ten Commandments by the letter R, the 613, then it, we know it makes no difference in our lives. But, the, but love, the Ten Commandments, is also included in the 613. So we have 10 and 11 is included in the 613. Okay? All right. So with that said, let's look at the first one and then we can talk about it. The first one is found, it's not in any particular order, all right? And it's going to be found in Exodus 20 and verse 1 and 2. Let's see if we can find that. Let me save this so I can, I can come back to it.
Exodus 20, verse 1 and 2. So we're going to look at that, and then we can look at something here. The first commandment, and then we're going to say, is that still relevant? I have Jesus in here. Okay, so the first is very important. It says, and God spake all these words, saying, remember, see, it's God again speaking all these words. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So the first one is that we must believe in God. See the list? I think this list here says, Number one, to know God. See if I can make it bigger. All right. It says, number one, to know that God exists. Exodus 20, verse 2. All right. So Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So what is that saying? That is saying that we, God said, you must believe in me. That's the first thing. Because I am God. As a matter of fact, there are some people who believe that this is the first commandment. Even though it does, it's not really a command, but yes, it's a command. He's saying, I am God. You must believe me. So some people believe that this is the first commandment. And then this is the second and so forth. Or some people can say, well, it's also included as a part of the first. It's a command to believe in God. You know? And you can look at, we know these 10 here. You, you, automatically, we can see 10. But we're going to do them in a different order. So the first one is that we must believe in God. And, 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 um, and Jesus said something when he was being tempted on the mountain. Oh, you ready? Okay. I'll be right there. So anybody want to say anything on that? Now, Matthew 4, verse 4. Matthew 4, verse 4, Yeshua said something. But he answered and said unto them, and said, and said, and said to the devil, the Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. What does that mean? Matthew 4, verse 4. Anyone? In relation to in relation to the commandments. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And when did that happen? Matthew 4, verse 4. I, I am submitting that when God speaks on the mountain to give the commands, everything came out of his mouth, we must believe. It cannot be um, taken away. It cannot be abolished. As Yeshua was referring to every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, we must live by. Not by anything else. So we have to know what he spoke. So go back to Mount Sinai and all the law that was given to Moses from Exodus 20 right down to the end of the the deliberation, I think, in Exodus 34, when Moses came back with a second commandment, all those laws, we look at them, he said, that's what we shall live by. So this we can use to show folks today who say that some of God's laws are not relevant. You say, G Yeshua's word says, every word that proceeded out of his mouth, we must live by, and nothing else. Any questions so far, or suggestions? Okay, so, so we move on. So that's the first one. We must acknowledge God that he is God. Is that, is that still relevant today? Yes. Uh-huh, of course. All right, the next one I think is found in Deuteronomy. D-E-U-T. Sorry, I'm putting too much here. Six. Deuteronomy 6 has a lot of commandments in them. 
Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. We say that a lot. And, and we know this, but we're looking at verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That means we must acknowledge God's unity. Let me see if, that, if, if that's what they have there. Right, number two, do not entertain the idea that there is any other God but the eternal. Two. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I see Miss Phyllis trying to come on. So God is saying here, I am unity. And the word used, we know for one, is, let's find it out here. Ekat. Which means, one is used one 687 times. First, 36 times, another, other, any, once, 11. Every certain sum. Well, the most popular one is one and first. Mm -hmm. It means I am the first, I am one. And it's the same word used, I believe. Let me check it so we can find out. Remember in the garden, um, does anybody know what word was used in when the Lord said to Adam and Eve, uh, you both flesh shall be one. We're gonna see. We're gonna find out now. I, um, I think that was Genesis. Is Genesis one or two? Can someone Google that for me quick, so I can put it up? I don't know if it's Genesis one or two. It says Genesis 2, 24, I think. Let me see. Yeah, Genesis 2, 24. 24. The two shall become one flesh. Yes. 24. Okay, so you see, we see the same word again. Ekad. Two shall be one. Same word used. So that is why um, Yeshua used the same term. We see that in the New Testament. Now, so, now there are some people who think that the Lord's prayer is, is what is found in Matthew 4, where the Lord was teaching his disciples to pray. But the Lord's prayer is actually found in John chapter 17. So we're going to look at that and hear Yeshua speaks about him being one with the Father, John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is can the Lord's prayer officially. This is this is one of the prayers where we are we are told exactly what Jesus said when he was praying. Many times he prayed, but we weren't told what he said. But this time he said something. So, so can someone read? Let me see how many verses here. This is the prior of Yeshua, so we're going to look at it and see what he's talking about in relation to acknowledge the unity of God. John 17, can someone read that now? John 17. Maybe I should have one that says uh, Yeshua. I need to find a version that says, um, but it doesn't matter anyway. John 17 and verse John 17, we're going to read John 17. Can someone read it? And then we can we unpack it verse by verse or a couple of phrases as we go. These words of speak Yeshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Uh, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Elohim, 
and Yeshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Oh yes, yeah, so verse 5, see, Yeshua is acknowledging that there was, he existed before. Glorify thou me with thine own self, as with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So before the world was, Yeshua is saying, I was there. Okay? Continue. Yes. I have manifested thy name unto the, unto the men which thou gavest me, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, set apart Father, keep it thou, keep it through thine own name, which thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. All right, so, we, so, stop there. so stop there for a minute there. It says, Holy Father, keep, thou, keep, through, thou, keep through thine own name who's, whom thou, thou hast given me, that we may be one, that they, sorry, is believers, may be one as we are, as we are. So the Lord is saying, he and the Father are one, two different persons, but they are one. Some, some scholars would say they are one in purpose and character, but two different persons. So even though in Deuteronomy 6 it says, Here are Israel, the Lord our God is one, yeah, Yeshua is saying both of them are one. That's what one means. You can have more than one person being one, like a family, one family. All right, continue. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, which thou gavest me. And I have kept them, and not one of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil they are not of the world even as I am not of the world sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth as thou hast sent me into the world even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. 
O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. That's the prayer of Yeshua. That's the, that, if you want to call it the Lord's Prayer, that's the official Lord's Prayer in the scriptures. The other one was just a teachable prayer to his disciples, which, which commonly called the Lord's Prayer. But this is it. Yeshua speaking and he's speaking about us and he's talking about unity. So we see the first one is believe in God and then believe in his unity and the same unity he wants us to have as followers. There's another scripture that says, um, and people will know us by our love also and by our unity. So if we are disunited and scattered all over the place, those who are looking will not want to join because we are confused or we are confusing them so far. So we have belief, unity. And we talk about love in the triangle. So the next one is love. Same, same Deuteronomy. Any questions so far before we move on? Our suggestions? Okay, so do we still need unity in the body of Messiah? Yes. Yes, we still do. So we belief in God is still relevant. Uh, unity in God is still relevant. And so the next one is going to be love. So all the commandments so far in the 613 that we are looking at is still relevant. Let's take it one by one. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Are we going to compare that to um, okay so it says here all Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might so they would say next command is you shall love God not only should we believe in him and believe in his unity also believe in you should show love to him. And we know how we show love, right? How do we show love? Can I say something before yes. you go on? I'm, rem I'm reminded of when the disciples uh, had gathered after Yeshua's death and they were gathered for Pentecost. Uh, um, Acts uh, 2 verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Okay, right, right, right. They have to be of unity again also, yes, before God can do his work. Unity is very important. I think it's 5 and verse 3. I have the wrong thing. Okay, so in, in, in lieu of the how do we know love, it says... Uh, all right, from verse 1, 1 to 3. 1 John 5, 1 to 3. I think I have that. Sorry. <laughs> One thing again. Yes. When we are, <laughs> I see Soto laughing at me now. When I is, <laughs> all of these are in the so-called Old Testament. Mm -hmm. When it says here that they were in one accord. Yes. I know it is difficult for men when I say men, I'm talking about humans. Human beings. To be okay. in one accord. And when mm -hmm. I say I'm talking about, this one accord has to be in belief. Yes. There has to come a point in time when we all have to be in one belief. Yes. Now, does that one belief mean that we'll all believe that I'm going back to when you first started, that okay, yeah. when we I were was, um, zig zigs uh -huh, I was when, going we wear, when we wear zit zit, it should be at the four corners and, and not a, a circular hem. Uh, is that one accord meaning that we should all agree on the name? Is that one accord meaning that um, whatever belief it is, what, what is that one accord that they are talking about? 
because in our circle, in our Messianic Hebrew root, root circle, yes. yeah, we all believe in Messiah. We believe that he's the son of God. We believe in following Torah. We believe in honoring the feast days. But there are fragments of beliefs among yes, of, a Messianic of, thing. So of maybe how to do how to do certain things. Yes. yes. So that one accord that the disciples had at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Because we know later on, some of them are going to have different opinions. Remember, I think, was it Paul who didn't want somebody to come with him because the fellow hadn't been believed as he believed? Yeah, what I is think the it was, one accord that, we're yeah. talking about? Yes. What is the one accord we're talking about? Okay, that's a good question. Can anybody come in and answer or make some, give us some ideas of what they think that means? I, I think the one accord is that they were told to go there and wait. Remember? They were, to, they, they, um, they were told to go there and wait. So I guess all gathered together because they know they had to go there and wait. And whatever they were doing, maybe praying, everybody was on one accord waiting for what the Messiah told them. Okay. okay. Anybody else? It's also the day that um, you know Moses gave the law on Mount Sinai too. So they, naturally, you know, being the Jewish to sit and them all being gathered together and being friends and you know, disciples of Yeshua. They'd be all in one accord on that day, not just because they didn't realize that he was going to be revisiting him and filling him with the Holy Spirit, the the, the Kadesh, the Ra Kadesh, but um, because of the um, holiday um, also as well. Yes, and also remember that before that, um, the the the, uh, the scripture only mentioned maybe two or three. But I, uh, we can assume that the others were thinking the same. They were jostling as to who will be the greatest and, you know, who is the best. I'm just putting some more stuff here now. Who is the best speaker? They weren't humble. So, so they have reached a point where they are humble and they're not um, grudging off each other anymore at that point. And they were willing to let the Lord work. <clears throat> but at that point, Sister Sandra, I don't think they fully had all the doctrinal... Um, things laid out, you know, they were still waiting to learn and so forth. So I don't think that one accord in that instance was agreeing with everything because they, still, they were still learning. But back in our day, they are, we're not going to have everybody agreeing until um, Yeshua comes. But what we can do is if the thing is not a salvation issue, we can let it go. Isn't, isn't everything a salvation? I don't like that term, you know. Isn't everything, everything in the Bible to be a salvation issue? Yes, it should be, but everything is, is not based on the interpretation I'm talking about of others. Like, for example, we bring up the, 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 the zit zit. Should it be at the corner or all around? That's not a salvation issue, how you do it. As long as you're obeying and have it, have it on, then if I go into a congregation, that's what they have, they, yeah, I'm going to follow. Or, you know? Or the, or the correct pronunciation of the Creator's name. Right, or the correct pronunciation of the Savior's name. If somebody say, I, you're not pronouncing it right, I'm not coming back to your congregation. You know? They have, they, those persons have not arrived yet at the top level, which is love and understanding. And I say, okay, at least, at least they are trying to obey. I can still worship with them, you know? Is it possible also too that um, the one accord was um, as as Yeshua had spent what was it about forty days or so with them? Yeah. Yes. Before days, they yeah. saw him depart, and he gave them some instruction to to tarry and to to occupy and so forth. That the one accord may have been a unity in purpose of vision. An expectancy of looking for something or waiting for something, which I believe in the scripture it says that they were waiting for 
Right, the and they promise all, that he had given. Yeah, they were all eager and waiting for it. Yes. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean that spiritually per se that they were all in the right or in the not the right. I'm sorry, in the same place because that's never ever going to be the place because the situation because we all have different experiences and we grow yes. individually in different areas. For example, um, I may have faith in one area let's say for instance i may have um because of my experience and my walk with the father and what i invest in my relationship with the father i may have um a higher level of faith for let's say healing but not the same level of faith for perhaps maybe finances and the father's provision in that area as maybe you, Paul, say then maybe Paul may have a higher level of faith in the area of that the father's going to provide for him financially so that he can provide for his family. But yes. then his faith as far as the father's ability to heal his body and make it whole may not be where my faith is. Right, right. So perhaps, um, you know, that was where the, the unity was, was in their vision and expectation of a promise that they were anticipating that yep. had been that had recently been promised right absolutely yes brother Sato. well uh, the, the the expression one accord appears several times in the book of acts brother soto for whatever reason i don't know if it's everybody but i can barely hear you yeah i can barely hear him too i'm gonna try to come forward is that better yeah yes thank you you're welcome the expression one accord appears several times in the book of Acts and Acts 4.24. We see um, the expression used when everybody all prayed together. In Acts 5.12, we have at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon Portico. In Acts 8.6, the cross with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as, as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. In Acts 12, 12, 20, we have now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him. In Acts 18, 12, but while Galileo was proconsul of Arcasia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now we know that that was an ivory Jew. And I, I think I lean more towards that the one accord is, yes, unity of purpose, but um, it is very narrow. I do not think it means um, unity of, of belief in every sense. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't see it that way. Even in the even at the time when the apostles were doing all these signs, we had some problems uh, that happened in the organizational structure of the young congregation that forced them to have to name deacons. And the main complaint is that they won't be treated fairly. The widows that had come from the diaspora were not being treated fairly in the daily distribution of food as the widows that were natives to Yerushalayim. And, and, and on account of that complaint, a, a moment ago we mentioned how uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas had to separate because in the first um, missionary journey, uh, Titus uh, got homesick and left. For the second time, Paul was not going to take him along. And he and Barnabas had a big argument over it. Right. And then and eventually, that's why Paul ended up with Silas. Yes. Let's not forget the famous book of Galatians where Paul had to have a confrontation with Peter face to face in a public setting because he held them responsible for many of the wars that were happening in Galatia. And that again was disputes. Uh, it, it turns out they had to uh, appeal to the, the central headquarter offices in Jerusalem to get that solved. So it doesn't always mean that we are unified in, uh, in belief, um, but more like in purpose. Now, of course, we have the verse when Messiah said that they might be one as you and I are one. Right. He himself. I, I interpret that the same way when we read in Shemot, when, when, when Yahweh says, and you shall be holy as I am holy. Or you shall be separate or set apart as I am separate and set apart. Kadosh. Um, 
I don't think any one of us will disagree that there's no way that anyone or all human beings could ever aspire on their own strength, on their own nature, on their own current situations to be as Kadosh as Yahweh himself. Agreed. So, so obviously the, the, the expectation there is to have a full commitment. And this is where enlightenment comes into view, intention comes into view. When your intention is to give your best and do your best and serve Yahweh with all your heart, with all your strength, without your soul, you're not being compared to anyone else. The day of judgment, you will be judged on your own, by your own standard, by your own enlightenment. And that's the fair way of doing things. Yeah. Right, right. As human beings, as we stand now, we're not all going to agree on certain things, but it shouldn't be a big disagreement where we separate ourselves. Sometimes, yes, the disagreement is big. We have to separate. <laughs> yeah. But there are some, some people separate for small, very small things. You know, there's, I always remind people, uh, Brother Soto and I always remind folks, you, you're not going to find a perfect congregation. No. That, That's you know? And if you ever found one, the moment you arrive, they'll have to kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no. I, I have, um, I don't know, looking at it from the, the Hebraic perspective, uh -huh. I think we, in a sense, the way that we as Westerners look at it, kind of have to take a little bit of an issue with the word perfect, because perfect. that can okay. actually that can actually kind of frustrate us. I like I like how Paul um, exhorts us that um, we should strive for certain right. things, that we should press for certain things, that we should be diligent, that we should be vigilant about things, knowing that with the Hebrew mindset. It's an ongoing work. Um, we're, we're constantly going from one level of glory to another. Uh, it's never going to, and I'm not even sure if when we get into eternity, we will have quote unquote fully arrived. Um, oh, no. I, I, think, I think it's going to be a perpetual refining process for all of us. Right, that's correct. Any other suggestion, question? Okay, I remember piggy last banking week. What, piggy banking on what she said. The yes, yes. That we are all a continuous uh, progressive work. We are in a cultivation process. Some of us are going to be behind and others are going to be ahead. I mean, uh, you can expect that if you have two very diligent individuals, well, one has been there five years earlier, well, the one who's there five years early and he's equally diligent is ahead of the game. It has more experience, has been exposed to more knowledge. It's just, yeah, it's no fault of the novice because they, they had to start and they're in a starting place, but there are going to be differences. Exactly, so, yes. That's guaranteed. I mean, I, I can, the best example I can give you is me and my wife. <laughs> uh oh <laughs> i knew you were gonna say that but <laughs> one more thing that reminds me of being in one accord uh when the children of israel came out of egypt and um yahweh told moses to have them meet at the foot of mount sinai they were to wash themselves and be there they were standing there in one accord at that point yes you get what I'm saying? They were sending it, it with one accord. I'm waiting, waiting to hear the voice. Okay. And also, also to may, may I also add, when you mentioned that, Sandra, as well, too, I, 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 I think of it also meaning let's work towards a common purpose, common goal. And again, uh, Brother Soto, like we were talking about earlier, um, that there, there's a vision and uh, th there's, a, there's a goal that the Father has set before us. Right, exactly. And so despite our differences, even sometimes culturally in background or uh -huh. even in experience or levels of maturity, that we put those things aside for the greater work, which is the kingdom of, the kingdom of Yah. And yes. make, making sure that that um, we're walking in alignment and in consistency with, with the word as much as possible and 
you know, just putting aside our differences and, and, you know, joining with, with each other because we know that we, we have to stay together and work together because there's strength in unity. And when the one sheep goes off and goes astray, that's when he becomes easy pickings for the enemy. So we're not going to find any place that completely agrees with what we know and whatever. And, and that's ever changing as we continually press into the word and we continually grow and we continually mature in the word. So we are an ever changing work. So um, I, I think that, you know, looking, looking at that as the purpose and the goal and the vision is key because the father tells us, I think, and I forget which book it is, but it's a common phrase that's quoted that um, there has to be vision. We have to have a vision, something that we're working towards and working yes, towards, yes. something that we see. And right, without it says without, that, without vision, the people perish. Exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And as you talk about vision, um, we can see in the prior, we, we need to study some more. That Yeshua was concerned about that. That's why he was praying. You know, he was very concerned. He can see this unity along the road. So he was praying that Lord, when he leaves, the Lord, that they may be one as we are one. Right. That's what we strive for. You know? I, I, I like, I like the, 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 the example um, Sister Sandra brings about on the, on the day of, on the mountain, Mount Arab, everybody was standing in one accord. Uh, you know, the key thing is everyone was standing in one accord, and that include the man that broke the Sabbath for gathering sticks. That include the priest that rebelled and was swallowed up by the earth. That included that generation that eventually would not make it to the promised land because they had sinned and they were so hard-headed. Everyone was standing there in one accord, but that doesn't mean that every heart was in one accord. That's right. I was going to mention that, that even though they were in one accord, you, you can imagine everybody agrees that Moses should go up and talk to God and don't talk. God's not supposed to talk to them. Nobody disagree with that. <laughs> you know, they say, oh, they, Moses, also, Moses be the guy. Also, you could look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Everyone uh -huh. was told to bring their, their um, things in, but they, they bring in but they did something different. So they, that means they were not on one accord with everybody else. With everybody else, right. They, they were doing something different. Okay. All right, so that, that's number, see that's three commandments and those are still relevant for today. Very important. Now we may look at two more possibly. All right, this one, I think oh, Jacinta sorry. asked a question last week. Uh, you have something? Yes. Okay, go ahead. No problem. It's Shabbat. Yeshua, is, Yeshua is praying yes. that we would be one. One. Is uh -huh. it with one with him? Uh-huh. Okay, I was going somewhere else. That's okay. <laughs> but he oh, okay. was talking uh, to the disciple at that time, didn't he? He, he was praying about 40 disciples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he said. I pray not only for them, but for others who will come also. He did say that in, in um, John 17. Because if somebody didn't follow up, they would say, see, Jesus is only praying for those people. But he says, Lord, I pray not, for all, not only for them, but for others who will also, who they will bring in, you know, in the global world. But you see, just, just that's how he and his father were one. Uh -huh. he, did, he did not say his own words. Right, right. In order for you to be one with somebody, both of you have to be in one in purpose, one in faith, one, one. Everything has to align. Yes. He can't That's have why. his opinion about something. Why are you looking at me like that, Brother Soto? Because you <laughs> and your husband are one. Huh? You and your husband are one, and you're right <laughs> with him. <laughs> right. to say that. We, sh we should be one, <laughs> but we have, we have different opinions. We have different, different uh, beliefs on certain things, uh -huh. right? But, but what Yeshua is saying, just as how he and his father are one, we 
who are his people should also be one with him, which means that we can't have differing opinions on his word. Do you understand what I'm saying? saying? To interpret his word. Well, it, it we can't interpret his word. We can't interpret his word different. It has to be the same. Is totally, it, it can have different viewpoint, but interpretation cannot be totally opposite. Well, maybe, I think it really depends sure. on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More or, or easier and more cut and dry, and there's no ambiguity in them. And the other ones, you know, they're especially with a lot of Paul's writing, really difficult to understand, especially if you're not well trained or taught. What, what I was what I was going to mention was, um, I I think one thing that we can keep in mind is the oneness. The oneness is going to come from the ruach that's given to each of us. The Holy Spirit. Okay, I think that's a big component of the unity because us having us having the impartation of that same spirit that helps us, as Yeshua said, to allow the same mind that's in Yeshua to dwell in us and to be developed in us as well as the spirit, I think that is one of the Core, core components to this unity and this oneness because I'm not operating in my own Ruach because we all have a Ruach of our own. Okay, we have, there's the Ruach Emet, there's, you know, his Ruach HaKodesh, we have our own Ruach, but, one, one Ruach. but one, okay. yes, having the Ruach HaKodesh that he imparts to us versus operating in our own spirit. You know, you know how sometimes we can say, man, you know, that person has a, such and such and such as a spirit, you know, and that's the person's individual personal spirit that he's walking in. But then there's the Ruach HaKodesh that's given to each of us. And then the father also says for us, and this is, this is where, our part comes in because oftentimes it's a two-part thing. The father has his part and then we have our part. And his part is the giving of the Ruach. Part of our part is to allow the word to transform our mind into the likeness of the mind of Yeshua. Right. I, I'm going to go a little bit political right now, just to give you an example, right? Um, I admire these, uh, this couple, political couples, yeah? And I, I want you to tell me why you think it worked. There are two opposites in beliefs, yet still they, I won't say what they are. Let me show you something. Um, yeah, that one is strange. Yeah, you sure. know where I'm going, right? Let me see if I can I don't share. think it's a recent one he's talking about. Um, Linda, it's an, uh, it's an older going, couple. I'm, I'm going. I'm going old school. I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember right, who, they, is, who they who they are. Is, but here is Mary. Yes. Natalie. All right. You know who she is. I've heard of her. All right. The the, the thing is right here. See. All right. See what she. Let me let me see if I did. I go too far there. And okay. It, it, can you see the screen or is it too uh, off the screen? No, it's good. No, we can see it. All it's right, clear. Go All right, you go back a little bit. Yeah. All right. So it says Mary Jo Matalin is an American political consultant, well known for her work with the Republican Party, right? She has served under President Ronald Reagan, director for George H. W. Bush, was the assistant to President Bush, and Vice President Dick Cheney. So she's a Republican strategist. And you know who her husband is? <laughs> A democratic political consultant. Her husband is a democrat political consultant, James Carville. Click on his name. Click on his name. All right, I, I have him up here. See, James yeah. Carville. Let's um let's do this one. Um 
See, Jeff Carville gained national attention for his work as lead strategist a successful president campaign for then Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton. And he continued to, he did work for Obama also and, and many other Democratic, while his wife is doing the opposite. The two are two opposites, yet still they are married from 1993. Let's see. Yes, 93. See, his name, Louis, for the Democratic, and she's married to the same Mary we we're talking about, 1993. No plans for any divorce, I have heard, nothing, everything going good, they love each other. <laughs> oh, they, they have a good rig. They yeah, they have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so that's how it should be. You know, we have difference of opinion, but we can live together. You know, that's all, that's all, that's what, the, that's what Yeshua is looking for. There are, two, there are, there are two um, um, guys. One is Keith Johnson. He was a former Baptist preacher. And there is Nehemia Gordon, who is a Karite Jew. Okay, yes. And the Karite Jews don't believe in Yeshua. Right. But he knows Torah. He believes uh -huh. in God. He uh -huh. loves God. And mm -hmm. Keith, uh, just recently in the past few years, he has um, come to Torah and the Sabbath and all of that. And both of them, they have a radio program and they both discuss Bible and give their insights. Right, and they're walking in unity because they thought they're working together at the same program. Sure they, sure, they have their discussion privately. You know, one is trying to con convert the other, of course, and they give him certain <laughs> things, but they, they, they're respectful of each other. And that's what we should be in anything we do in different walks of life, even if we disagree with certain folks, we can do it respectfully, you know? But Nehemiah accept Messiah now. You know who Messiah is. He even accept Matthew in the, in the New Testament. Uh, no. I don't think he's a fault. No, he's not Nehemiah, a believer. Nehemiah has not uh, accepted Messiah. But what he did, what happened was that um, he had an opportunity to make a book and a review on an earlier work from someone else on the Shem Tov Matthew, which is a Hebrew version of Matthew of the Middle Ages, that they were able to discover through textual analysis that it bear so much similarity with first century construction methods and how sentences and wordings were placed that they figured that unlike the other three Matthews that are available, this one Matthew version came from a possible authentic first century. Uh, another scholar, I can't remember his name, had done that discovery 25 years earlier. And he was presented with that book. And then he figured a way that he could take. He's frozen. Yeah, he maybe, have, maybe, with, yeah, maybe have frozen. some internet, maybe have some internet problems, problems yeah. here. So once he comes back, he was saying something important there. Once he gets back, when he realizes he might be, the internet might be down a little bit. Okay, I, so, I but, okay, he's back. Yes, oh, you're back. So you, 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 you went off for a minute, so continue. This is the second team. time it's happened. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know what part you heard. <laughs> <laughs> you were so busy talking. <laughs> well, all I'm saying is that Nehemia, um, piggy bank on the research that was done by another scholar 25 years er earlier about the Shem Tov Matthew. And um, what he did to his credit, he, brought down, he, he made a simpler version of that work, more user readily, uh, more user read, uh, readable. Okay. And then he went with Michael Rood of the Rood um, Awakening, tour in the United States and got a lot of support because of he being a Karakite Jew, and at the same time, recognizing the Shem Tov Matthew as being probably based on a first century original. Right, that, he, believes, that, he believes that it was maybe Hebrew writing. Right, yes. yes. But it does not mean he believes in Messiah. He believes in Messiah, that is but not, but not, but not Yeshua. But not in Yeshua, Messiah. But not in Yeshua, no. Yes, in... yes, yes. <laughs> and he's been around many of them. I mean, even till now, if you go into YouTube, you'll find Michael Rule and him doing all kind of YouTube programs and all kind of scholarship material that is of interest. And he will talk about Messiah. He, you know, was, he used the language that Michael Rood would use um, and say Messiah, 
uh, 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 but he's only being polite because he is in that venue. Yes. But he does not believe, and if you go to his website, he will tell you that yeah. he cannot accept the Christian Messiah. Oh, he, can, he cannot accept Christ the Messiah because the, that will be to him idolatry and the, and the Torah forbids that. Right, and, that, and, that's, and that's a good start, you know, a good start to have a dialogue like that. That's what we're talking about, respect each other. And so you can only reach people by showing respect for them. In the, like, like, like the Apostle Paul, you know, when he saw the people worshiping idols, he, he, he got into their conversation by saying, hey, I see an idol that says to the unknown God. Let's, let me talk about that one. You know, it doesn't, it did not tell them that the other gods were false. That's not the right way to go about doing it. You know, talk to them about something that you are, you can agree with, something you see in every religion, everything you can see, something common uh, you can talk about. You don't denigrate another thing. person's religion. Yes, it doesn't oh. matter what religion it is. You can, um, you can, I, I remember going to my neighbor's house, she's an Indian. I was a little bit surprised, but not um, too much surprised. I see, I saw the Buddha statue, and I was taken aback a little. I didn't, I didn't know she was uh, a Buddhist, <laughs> and I, and I, and I invited myself to her, to her uh, congregation, but she didn't want me to go because she said, "Oh, they're, they're not, they're not ready yet. I don't want you to go," you know. But I didn't condemn her. I said, "You know, you're not supposed to do Buddha." But no, I didn't do that. You know, we continued to talk, you know, and have a good conversation. And a couple of times she would send over some bacons, you know. She's Caribbean too. So she sent over some cake and, and we eat food and, you know, show respect. That's how you can break the ice to bring in something else with most people. Okay, we're going to do one more. So you see, we're breaking down the, the 613 commandments. We were just at number three. So number four, one more we're going to do. And that's it. Uh, I remember last week or maybe the week before, Jacinta was asking the question about um, fear. What does fear mean? So the next commandment in the 613 is Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13 uh, that they have. It says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. This has about um, three commands in there. But we're going to do with the first one. Fear, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. What does it mean, the question she was asking, to fear God? All right, so... <clears throat> We're going to let the Bible give an answer and then we can come in. So let's do Proverbs 1. Let's do, yeah, let's do Proverbs 1. And then I think it's verse 7. Let's see what we're going to use the wise man Solomon. See what he says. Fear there doesn't mean I should have maybe go look it up. To be afraid. Proverbs 1, 7. Okay. All right, so hear what he says in Proverbs 1, 7. He says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and obstruction. So fear here doesn't mean to be afraid. If you're afraid of somebody, you're not going to get any knowledge from the person. Are you afraid? You're going to hide. Let's see what the Hebrew word is uh, and the meaning. Fear, fear, okay. 3374. All right, so it's giving you a different meaning. But the one that we know, it has fear of God, meaning respect, reverence, piety, revered. <clears throat> While the word can also mean terror and awesome or terrifying thing, object causing fear. But the, see, they have number C, fear of God. That's what they talk about. They give you the meaning of fear of God, respect, reverence, and piety. Not, not, not that we are afraid of him. If you're afraid of somebody, you just, you just obey him because you're afraid or because you don't want to go in the fire and so forth, you know, if you believe that. I'm afraid he's going to kill me, you know. And if I forget to pray this morning, I'm going to get in an accident, you know. That's but, not God. But, a, but also, too, um, another good um, description would be also to to highly esteem or to exalt or to lift up to make him the highest, the most important? Yes. 
Uh, yeah, that's what it says here. Respect, reverence, piety. Oh yeah, I was looking for esteem. Esteem is also one there, yes. Is the, is the word, when we use the word fear in our English or westernized mindset, does it ever mean um, respect and reverence? Uh, no, because sometimes we, when we put it to the children, you know, you need to fear God. That means you're, you're telling them. <laughs> and some people, I hear, I'm going to put a fear of God in you. <laughs> yeah, typically when it's used um, in, in our culture, typically when we use the word fear or we, when we see it being used, it's not in the sense of, of reverence or respect, but in the opposite sense of trembling, being afraid um, in, in that sense. Yes. Right. Well, also, also to remember that we're reading the King James Bible as it has survived today. And many English words, three, four hundred years ago, had a slightly different uh, understanding or definition. Yes. Uh, and so it's very possible. I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying it's very possible that four, five hundred years ago, the word fear did convey the idea of respect besides being afraid. Okay. And that's why it was used. And then yes. maintain the translation. It's like, uh, it's like the word conversation. When we read in James, uh, in the King James Bible, that uh, let our conversation be for the edification of those around us, you immediately think of what you speak. But, but when you look up the Greek word that is translated, this actually means your lifestyle. Not just what you speak, but your whole yeah. meaning, everything you do. Everything but what you do, happened right. is that at the time that King James was translating that, they translated according to their time. And that time, conversation did not mean what was coming out of your mouth but your whole demeanor, lifestyle, and character, your reputation. That was yes. your conversation. Now the word has been retained to modern time, but no longer carries the same meaning. So it's very possible that the word fear here, as it's been used consistently by the King James scholars, probably didn't mean also reverence, but obviously it doesn't do that today. Right. It's, like, it's also like the word gay. Oh yes. The word gay. <laughs> Yes, yes. You have hijacked that word. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, um, this one I learned when I was a, a child by heart, you know. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. After, the, after Solomon was talking about all things is vanity, I think that's what Ecclesiastes talk about everything is vanity, but the conclusion is we must fear God, respect Him, esteem, show love, and keep His commandment. For this is the whole duty of man. So that's one of the command. That's one of the six thirteen, and all that commandments that we have looked at so far, they are still relevant. Taking it step by step, nothing is wrong with none of those. And you know, Maury, that verse that you just mentioned is it, very good because. Um, if the word their fear meant to be afraid, there will be no reason to say to keep his commandments. Keep his commandments, yeah. Yes. You know, there, there's yes. no reason to say. When you're afraid of somebody of power and authority, you do whatever they tell you because of fear alone, not frightened because of the power. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're telling you to fear him and, and to keep, keep his commandment is for you to show a, a, a lifestyle of obedience that is that, that reveals how you esteem him. Right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that you're so frightened of him. Right, I, exactly. So we, we have a better understanding of who God is so we can explain it to others who don't believe. And this is why we believe in God. Because you have a misunderstanding of what God is, that's why you don't believe. But I'm going to show you what God is in his true light. Okay. As far as says, for God shall bring him a word in the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So as we continue to study these words and to look at these commandments that most people are said is done away with, we see that the more we look at them, we, we, the more we learn of God. That's what we have seen here. We believe in him, that knowledge is unity. We love and we fear. And the fear and we also serve him. That's, that's the five, five commandments so far in the 613. So, so far we are seeing... Nothing wrong with the commandment so far. 613, five of them out of the way. All right, any suggestions so far? What time is it now? 308? I just, I just want to add one thing back to where we're discussing about um, um, Nehemiah Garden. Uh -huh. 
And I, I heard him in a segment. He was saying that um, Keith Johnson wanted him to teach him Hebrew. And he said to Keith that he would teach him Hebrew if he promised him one thing, that he would never bring up the New Testament to him, Nehemiah. And that was the agreement. And then Nehemiah went to the Vatican and for somehow he got into the basement, he said, and was coming, uh, he, he had some whole documents he was going through. And he found one writing he, in, his, um, in the Hebrew language about the New Testament, about Mat Matthew. And when he read it and compare it with some of the writings that they have in their um, Torah or whatever it is, then he acknowledged Matthew and he called back to Keith Johnson and tell him he have to break a little agreement. When, <laughs> what is it? He said he come to accept Matthew. At least Matthew, to, okay. Yeah, but he shouldn't tell him anymore. He only accepted <laughs> Matthew. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So just, just, just let me add a little bit to that story, uh -huh. because your question to ask, what was Nehemiah Gordon doing in the Vatican? Um, how did he end up at the Vatican, at the library, in uh -huh. the bodega downstairs, which is really for uh, top scholars? Uh, uh, he didn't end up there accidentally. He was looking for the Hebrew Shem Tov Matthew. Mm. Because as I said, he had come across that book already. He says it. He came across that book. But he is the kind of person that, that is very skeptical. He does not like to accept even the words of another scholar. If mm -hmm. that scholar said in such a um, public library in London, there's this manuscript, he's going to go there, fly there, and look at that manuscript himself. himself and read yeah. it himself. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the kind of individual he is. He does not like to take a essay, even from a fellow scholar. So he went there, secured a copy of it, studied it. He could see the many um, parallelisms in the sentence structure of the Shem Tov Hebrew Matthew that was different from the other three that exist and that made it very much alike the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was using the same language and pattern and parallelism that you find in the Hebrew, in the Tanakh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he realized, okay, this is no ordinary Matthew. Now he grants, this is not the original Hebrew Matthew, mm. but, but it looks like it's a copy that was made having an original Hebrew Matthew in front of them. And uh, on account of that, he saw the value from an archeological point of view. And he's come to agree, yes, it's, there's a good chance now that much of the uh, New Testament was originally written in Hebrew or in Aramaic and later translated into Greek. And so he's joined that debate of what they call Greek supremacy. But um, I, I just want us to not think, <laughs> Jena, 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 yeah. Nehemiah Gordon is an excellent resource for many things. Yeah. But he should not be our example. He does not recognize Hamashiach. Right, right. yes, he yes. All right. So when, when I listen to him, I, I, and I realize he's making a lot of money off of Christianity. And, you know, you get, you get very polite when your income grows and swells because a lot of people are pouring in money. You get very polite. Why, 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 why get rid of that? You know, why shake it? So <laughs> just, uh, I'm not questioning him. Oh, my, 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 I said that, but I did not mean to disparage him or discredit him or his scholarship. Okay, now that quick, my question is sincerity. Quick, 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 quick question. Come here, we can do it quickly. He said, why do we use say Yahweh, how do we know that is correct? Uh, we said that earlier, I think Bo mentioned it. We, we do not um, get caught up in the pronunciation. We, we use the name that we think it is. And, and it's go by the, uh, what we found in the Hebrew manuscript. I mean, they just add some vowels to it. You can add any vowels you want. Because some people say Yehovah, some, some people say, Yehovah, say Yahweh, Yahweh, some say Yahweh. 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 Yeah, yeah, Yahuwah, Yahoo. Uh, we don't care what it is. Just when, you know, try to try to pronounce his name. When when Yeshua comes, we will only get the right name. Yeah. But there yeah, are some people. But, but, yes. New name. He will come yeah, but, with a but, name upon his thigh. Okay. Right. He says he's gonna come with a new name on his thigh. Yes, exactly. 
So whatever we want to call it, our congregation don't for or but there are some congregations who will don't want you to pronounce it and you have to pronounce it the way they think it should they be. Think, and, yeah. and those are intolerant so, groups. Um just one question here. I um I'm listening to you talking. Just about Cynthia, get closer to your mic so that we can hear oh, you. You're not you're not hearing me? Hearing very, you very now. faintly. Just now. You're hearing me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm listening to you talking about Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson and um, the book of Matthew and all of that and his scholarship and his research and all of that. Um, just recently, I understand that he, he said that he has gone all over the world and found um, ancient manuscripts, which has the vowel point. And he and um, those vowel points would indicate the name Yehovah. So um, I don't know if you um, believe his scholarship or no. I'm just asking. Yeah, but they, just to answer that, that maybe Soto can come in after. Um, the vowel points were not inspired. That's what we know. They were they were put in after just to make us who don't pronounce Hebrew able to pronounce it. So the vowel points are not uh, inspired um, vowels. Actually, it wasn't even for us. It, this started to happen around the uh, year 700, 800 years of the common era. The priests, uh, actually the rabbis in Europe, started to realize that the Jews themselves were forgetting how to read Hebrew. And so alarmed by the fact that their own population, their language was dying and it was being corrupted into other forms, they decided to do something about it. And they introduced vowel points. These are right. periods and dashes to the Hebrew text that never had them. So when Nehemiah says that he found something that has uh, the vowel points, well, he's not the first person to discover that. The, 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 the word Jehovah, or uh, Yehovah in, in, in German, it was a, a guy by the name of Galotinos. He was a Catholic monk who at the time had been commissioned by the Pope in the early 1500s to write a new German translation to be used to counteract the, the influence of Martin Luther and the other Protestants. So he came across a manuscript that's, that showed the vowel points, Yehovah. And he rendered that into German as J-E-H-O-V-A-H. But what happened is, what looks to us as a V is actually a U in Germany. And what looks like a J is actually an I. So a German will look at that and will never pronounce it the way the English people do. We have the same characters in our alphabet. So we just give it the English pronunciation and say Jehovah. But it's not the real pronunciation that Galutinos and the Germans have. It's just a matter of not understanding that we should have used other characters to bring the sound over. But my point is, what Nehemiah may have discovered is not a great discovery. Galutinos are in 1518 already discovered that. And that's why he introduced that to the vernacular. And all of the pointing uh, of vowel points is, is come from the Masoretic text which is 800, 900 of the common era. Back in the days of Messiah, there was no such vowel point system. None. Right, once so we understand that, that's, why, that that's yes. why we do not fussy about how you want to pronounce it. As long as, as, long as uh, Yah knows who you're talking to, he knows who you're praying to, he will answer your prayer, and then he will take care of that. All right. I want to thank everyone again for coming. It's a wonderful discussion. But before we go, if Michelle is on the line, we want her just to give us an update on her mother. Yeah. Is Michelle, are you on? Are you listening? Maybe she's on, but if she's at home, she might be taking care of her mom right now. Okay. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you for coming again. Uh, Jacinta, did you give Joyce the new link? Yes, I sent it. Yes, I did. Okay, all right. Maybe she's off. Maybe she's busy today. All right. All right. We want to thank you again for coming. It's a wonderful discussion. And next week, we're going to continue with the different 
commandments in the 613 and see there's nothing fancy about them really. It's just, just some numbers. So, so far we are in agreement with all of the four or five that we looked at so far. All right. Any, any, anything else? It just let me uh, uh, piggyback on something here. Um, the Greek language has preserved in first century time the attempt to pronounce the and, and preserve the pronunciation of the tetragrammaton from Hebrew into Greek by using five vowels: the I, the A, O. U E and there are a number of Greek manuscripts that have that in place of what will be the Hebrew tetragrammaton. That sounds very convincing argument in favor of the phonetic pronunciation as Yahweh. The problem is we can agree those are those five vowels. We can agree that the Greeks did use that in an attempt to bring over what they taught was the Hebrew pronunciation of the name of Elohim. But what we cannot agree is how they were pronounced. Because mm -hmm. nobody knows how languages are actually pronounced beyond five, 600 years from now. Right. You can go back five, 600 years, you'd speak to any linguist that, they, that, that, that know their stuff and they will tell you that is the case. So we don't really know if the I was pronounced in the Greek 2000 years ago, the way we are saying it's pronounced, or the A, or the O, or the U, or the E. So the, the truth of the matter is no one, no one in this planet right now can be 100% sure of how the tetragram and turn ought to be pronounced or was pronounced. But we do have in Sephaniah that one promise, that one prophecy, that the day will come when Yahweh will restore the language to a pure language and it says, and then his name shall be one. Yes. Yeah. And if we and, and maybe one of the best ways is maybe just to use a short version. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, here we have here we have the short version in Psalm sixty-eight, uh, verse four. Sing unto God, sing praises to His name, extol Him that ride it up on the heavens by His name, Yah. It should be Yah, not Ja, and rejoice before Him. That's just a short version of the name. May I also may I also see, add? Let me see what it says. Yeah. May I also add that when you go back and you look at the um, original 1611 King James, you'll see something very interesting. You will not find, you will not find a letter J in that Bible because the letter was created yeah, it came, much right. later. Yes. So there, there wasn't even a J letter in the English language originally. And I think that there's also something very similar between the U and the V as well, too? And even the V and the W, I think, yes. Okay, the V and the W, right. Yes. I couldn't remember. I knew it was another one, and, but I wasn't sure. I knew it was another pair, V and, okay, yeah, the V and the W. Yeah, some people say it's Yahweh or Yahweh. You know, right. It all depends, yeah. Well, the, the reason people say Yahweh is because they're not reading it in German. Because that comes from, you see, the tetragram and turn, if you read the, uh, the old German dictionaries, it's spelled J-A-H-V-E-H. That's how they translate it. But that is not pronounced Jave in Greek. I mean, in German, that is pronounced Yahweh. The J is the I. That's to do to this day. If you look at the month of June, spelled in German, it is J-V-N-E, and they pronounce it Yun. Mm. Speak to any German. And the pronunciation is Yun, but they spell it J-V-N-E. So we have to understand that you cannot use another language where they are respecting the phonetic sound of their language to bring something over, tra transmitted over to their language. But because the alphabets are the same to the English letters, now you're gonna take it and pronounce it the English way. You know, you're not, you're not being fair, no, no correct. And that's what happened, what was happening with the pronunciation Java. That is not what the German who created that transliteration would have pronounced it like. Right. Yeah, so that's why you use the short version, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but trust me, I know that yeah, I don't care what you call him, as long as he knows what you, you're talking to him. But as, as we get educated, of course, you, you, know, you want the other pronunciation, but 
we leave that up to him when he comes and tell us which one it is. So we're not gonna, and, we're not gonna cause separation or disunity. We shouldn't cause separation or disunity because of different pronunciations. Right, because we do not know it fully what it is. Amen. You know, that's, that's, that's talking about unity, that's a good example right here. Because um, you notice I always use Yahweh. Yes. I prefer Yahshua, I do not use Jesus. Right. Uh, Evan Moray uses Jesus quite frequently. Now, yes. uh, <laughs> very frequently, I should say. Okay. Uh, however, um, we are united. We are together. We worship together. We are serving together. Uh, we will not make that be an issue that will separate us. Uh, and that's because of him and my, my and we wanted to be united. So uh, would I describe us in one accord? Yes. I would describe yeah. us in one accord, even though we have some minor differences. So for now, anytime you have me singing, you're going to still see Yahweh or Yahweh. Of course. And I, and I don't. <laughs> right. And, you, I, see that? Well, and you know, I didn't object to you. I said, hey, you need, you need, right. you need to do that. <laughs> 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 you know, it doesn't matter to me one or the other. <laughs> Everybody has a right to how they're going to view that, except one person, my wife. She has no rights whatsoever. Again. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so again we want to thank you for keeping us on the zoom platform and um, we want to um um we don't know when we're gonna go back because they said they're spiking up spiking all over the place so big spike big big spike, yeah. spike so, today. so we just have to be careful Four thousand. yes yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. 4,000. Okay. 49, 4,049, I guess. All right. So that's what let's, they're saying. Let's but keep, they're safe, keep that true. family safe, keep the elderly safe, those who are sickly safe. Better to be safe than sorry, they say. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But with all that, is, all that is going on in the world, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Right. Just have to be careful. Best to be sorry, best to be safe than sorry. That's the nice proverbs. I think it's an African proverb there. Okay, so we do the Aaronic benediction. Siva reheha Yahweh merish merecha. Yahir Yahweh panavelecha mehuneka. He saw Yahweh panavelecha. Yes, lecha. Amen. Amen. Amen.